and welcome to Intro to Object-Oriented Programming in Python. My name is Joseph, and I'll be your navigator in this video course. You've probably figured out from the title, this course is about object-oriented programming, often shortened to OOP or even OOP. Because I find it kind of hard to say OOP with a straight face, I'll stick with OOP. OOP is a programming paradigm. That is, it's a way of thinking about writing code and structuring your programs. It's a kind of philosophy based around a few organizing principles. And by applying these principles to software design, you can build robust, maintainable applications that not only scale more easily, but are friendlier to collaboration. In this course, you will learn the syntax and rules surrounding OOP, but the focus is really to get you thinking about code through an object-oriented lens. My hope is that this will not only improve your ability to write code, but also provide you with a vocabulary you can use to talk about what you've written, as well as discuss programming in general, both of which will be essential in your Python development journey. In this course, you'll learn how to use classes to apply object-oriented principles in Python, create objects by instantiating those classes, how to model the properties and behaviors of real-world systems and entities using attributes and methods build child classes using inheritance and the built-in super function. And finally, leverage OOP's principles of encapsulation, abstraction, inheritance, and polymorphism to write clean, flexible code. To get the most out of this course, you should be comfortable with Python fundamentals. Things like variables, functions, built-in data types, and general Python syntax. I'll be explaining everything as we go along, but it will help if you have a good grasp on functions, especially defining your own functions. So if you feel like your knowledge on that needs a bit of a top up, check out defining your own Python function. And next up, we'll take a 10,000 foot view on object oriented programming, as well as its place in the Python ecosystem. Like I mentioned, OOP is a programming paradigm, and it's used in a wide variety of languages. At a basic level, it's all about structuring your code in a way that data, or properties, are grouped together with related behaviors, or actions. This is done via objects and classes. Objects contain both data and behaviors, called attributes and methods. Attributes represent data, and methods represent behaviors. You can use them to emulate real-world entities or systems. For example, you could have an object that represents a person with properties like name and age and behaviors like walk, talk, or write code. But where do objects come from? That's where classes come in. Classes provide a blueprint for creating objects. These objects are then called instances of that class. Classes also define the type of instances created from the class. So if you had a person object, they would be based on a person class. The class is what defines the properties the object can have and what actions it can take. And because the class is a blueprint, you could use that class to create as many instances of person as you want. 8 billion if you like. As a programming paradigm or philosophy, OOP has four guiding principles. Encapsulation, inheritance, abstraction, and polymorphism. Starting with encapsulation, encapsulation allows you to group data and behaviors into a single unit, an object. The object has the data it needs, and that data should only be modified by methods exposed by the object, which would be part of its behavior. This promotes data integrity and modularity in the application. Inheritance is a means of code reuse. You can create new classes that are based on existing classes and form class hierarchies. Child classes inherit the methods and attributes of their parents, and can even add to or modify them. This is great for code reuse and reducing code duplication. Abstraction is the practice of hiding implementation details, exposing only the essential functionality of an object and thereby simplifying interactions. Broadly, you shouldn't need to know how an object does something to use it, only what it does. Finally, polymorphism allows you to treat objects of different types as if they are all instances of the same base type, as long as they have a common interface. That is, if they behave the same way under the same circumstances. This drives well with Python's approach to typing in general, known as duck typing. If it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, treat it like a duck. As the developer, this lets you code to interfaces and not types. That's a lot of theory, but what does OOP look like in practice? In Python, consider this example. Say you have a database of people, like officers on a ship's crew, with information about each crew member. 
how would you store this data for use in your program? One approach would be to use one of Python's built-in primitive data structures, like the list. It might look like this. Kirk equals a list with the values James Kirk, 34, Captain, and 2265. This is a very bare bones approach. If you wanna access a specific value like Kirk's rank, you're limited to using indexes, grabbing the third element in the list by accessing index two. This requires remembering the correct index and ensuring that every list of crew member details is the same length and has the same elements in the same order. That's all extra work for you, the developer, and that's what makes this error prone, hard to maintain, and difficult to scale. Alternatively, using OOP and a little more upfront programming effort, you could create a crew class. To keep things simple, this example doesn't show how it's made, it just assumes you've already made it. Then, instead of creating Kirk the list, you would create Kirk the instance of the crew class, passing in the same values. With this approach, grabbing his rank would be as simple as accessing the rank attribute using the dot accessor. Using classes like this, any object holding data about crew members will have a consistent interface, with the added benefit of accessing attributes by name, simplifying things for whoever is writing and later reading the code. Additionally, because you create the class up front, you can later add or remove functionality by modifying the class definition, i.e. the blueprint. That's what makes the OOP approach extendable as well, like adding behaviors via methods, something you wouldn't be able to do with the list approach. Okay, hopefully I've sold you now on the benefits of OOP, and you're ready to ask the question, how do I create classes? Well, the answer is waiting for you in the next lesson. So far, you've learned that classes are the blueprints for objects. But how do you define a class in Python? The simplest possible class definition could look like this. Class crew, colon, pass. You define a class using the class keyword. By the way, in Python, it's convention to use title case for classes, so that's why the C in crew should be capitalized. And be sure to indent the contents of the class for spaces. In this example, you would use the pass statement as a placeholder for the actual contents of the class to avoid an error. Then you can instantiate, that is, create an instance of the class by calling it with parentheses. For example, crew instance equals the result of calling crew. Open up the REPL and we'll play around with this a little. To practice working with objects, imagine you're making a game about space exploration. In such a game, you might find it useful to have a class that models starships, space vessels. So to start, you're going to use the class keyword, class starship, colon, and for now, the class body will be the pass keyword. I'm recording this as Python version 3.14 is pretty new, and I'm loving the improved syntax highlighting in the REPL. If you're on a different version, it'll probably look different, but don't worry, it's just cosmetic. And even with only these two lines of code, you can create instances of Starship. Try it by calling Starship. The return value, which is evaluated by the REPL and displayed, is main.starship object at some memory address. This is the default behavior for how Python describes user-defined objects. And pay attention to what happens if you call Starship again. You'll see that the memory address is different because a new object is created each time, which makes sense, right? Instances should be distinct. Of course, you'll usually want to assign your objects to variables. So create two new Starship instances. For fun, let's call them Voyager and Galactica. And you can use the built-in type function to see, yes, they are Starship objects. Type Voyager returns class main.starship. Type Galactica returns the same. Finally, to be sure that they're discrete objects, use the equality operator to compare the two. Voyager double equals Galactica returns false. They are two separate objects in memory. Okay, so admittedly, your Starship class is not much of a blueprint so far. These objects have neither behaviors nor properties. You could make as many crew instances as you want, but you wouldn't be giving them their own attributes. To do that, you'll need to add a little more code to the class definition. See what exactly in the next lesson.